For so many people, some of them who might be watching or listening to my podcast right now, who have either adopted a whole food plant-based lifestyle, maybe they're considering making the switch, maybe they're newbies, or just maybe they've just been doing it for a while. And it just seems that there's to be barriers, barriers to either making the change or, or staying on track. And that's mm-hmm. one of the number one things that I hear about. And I'm so glad that you are going to tell us about what we can do and give us some solutions. Well, I'll try. <laughs> this is going to be a nutshell version. You know, I'll provide a few tips, but hopefully the viewers today will recognize themselves in one of these barriers and then decide to pursue it a little more. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, do you want, we have some true or false questions because we play our game true or false. Do you want me to start with one of those or do you want to start with your presentation? Sure. Yeah. Let's have a true and false. Okay. It's time for true or false on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay. Green Warriors, get ready for the first true or false question. And here it is. True or false, even when we're eager and ready to make changes, the mere thought of doing so can cause us stress. All right, Green Warriors, type in true or false. And you can even put a comment next to that if you feel that you want to talk more about your feelings about that. And Sid, what do you have to say about that? The answer is definitely true, Amy, because even though change is an unavoidable part of life, just the mere thought of making changes can trigger anxiety in some of us. So in my book, there's a chapter called The 12 Barriers to Change, which are the most common roadblocks that I've observed over the years that keep people stuck, even when they want to change their diet. So today's presentation, as I mentioned, is just a drop in the bucket regarding each barrier and it, it only offers like small tidbits of advice. But um, if you are struggling, if you, you know, if you're watching this and you're struggling to make changes stick, perhaps you'll recognize yourself in one of these barriers and uh, then you'll want to explore it deeper. Okay. Well, before we go on, I did want to talk about your book just a little bit called The Plan A Diet. And I'm so excited because you were so generous that you are actually going to give one of these books away and we're going to have a giveaway and I'm going to be putting in the show notes and later in the comments going to be putting a link for everybody to see what they can do where they can go to try to win this book and it is a wonderful book and it and it does have a lot of great tips in there and I'm sure that people that anybody that looks at this even if they're a seasoned plant-based person they're going to find lots of pearls of wisdom here So I'll be telling you more about that book giveaway coming up a little bit later. Okay. Did you want me to go to the next question or did you want to start? Let's uh, go to the slides and start with the barriers and then go from there. We could. Okay. So the first barrier (laughs) is ignorance, right? Some people, and there's two types of ignorance, blind ignorance and willful ignorance, And blind ignorance is if someone has truly never heard the message about how our diet affects our health. But people who are watching your your podcast, Amy, they're certainly not going to fall into that category of blind ignorance, right? Now, willful ignorance is when someone is aware that their food choices matter, but they just don't care. They're sort of apathetic about it, or they have an attitude of indifference about it. And they'd rather not know about the health consequences of their poor diet, right? So it's kind of apathy and willful ignorance go hand in hand. And apathy is defined as the absence of emotions. And sometimes that can be a precursor for depression. So if we have apathy, it's important to to address that. So a few of the underlying issues when it comes to apathy could be boredom or stress or isolation, or low self-worth. So to combat apathy, it's important to, um, hang on, I'm just trying to adjust my screen here. Yeah. 
it's important to first recognize what's causing it and then take steps to regain your motivation because motivation is what combats apathy. And one way to become motivated is to pick a, pick a hobby or an interest that you have uh, interest in that has the most potential to engage you, like something that you'll really do, and then set a few goals around that. Like maybe you'd like to learn how to uh, learn a new language or a skill or play an instrument and then break that interest down into small action steps and commit to move forward with that every day for at least a couple of weeks and then carry that newfound motivation into setting goals for your weight and health issues as well. So that's the topic of ignorance, blind ignorance and willful ignorance. That's the first barrier. Actually, those are two. So the third barrier would be the fear of change, right? Fear of change is a big one because fear disturbs our perceptions and can keep us stuck when we're asked to do something unfamiliar or outside of our comfort zone, or when we're asked to consider a new way to shop and cook for food, or when we have to face new changes to our routines and our habits. We might even fear another failure if we've been unsuccessful with diet changing in the past. You know, if we have failed at past diets, we now might have a fear of change. So the trick about this is to don't let a spirit of fear overtake you, but instead take some time for deep reflection to figure out what your fears actually are and then write them down. And this is going to take some soul searching and some thought, right? Like what's holding me back? What am I, am I afraid of something? And what, what is that? And then after you write them down, what they could possibly be, evaluate those fears to see if they're even legitimate, right? Sometimes we, we have false things in our mind, you know, that aren't even true. They fears that aren't legitimate. So ask yourself if, if those fears were to ever come to fruition, would they somehow pose a danger to you or to someone else? And usually the answer is no. So that's one way to get over fear of change is to write them down, really evaluate them for what they are. And even if that what you're afraid of came to pass, would it be a danger to, to you or to someone else? Probably not. So fear of change is something we don't have to really be fearful of. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe there, this would be a good time for a true and false question. Okay, great. Let me go back over to our questions and I'm going to post that up in just a sec. Okay, here we go. All right. True or false. Short-term trials are necessary in order to achieve long-term results. Hmm. What do you think, Green Warriors? Type in what you think the answer is. And Sid, what do you have to say? The answer to that is definitely true, which brings us to the fourth <laughs> barrier, which is the avoidance of pain, right? And this one is very common. And this is not talking about physical, per physical pain per se, but anything that has to do with too much of a hassle or inconvenience to deal with, right? It's a pain in our neck. We don't want to have to do that. That's what I'm talking about when I say the avoidance of pain. It's not referring to physical pain, but anything we see as a hassle. <laughs> so if someone is unwilling to endure the short-term trials that are necessary to achieve results, then unfortunately, they'll never see the long-term gain or benefits. So, for example, when you improve your diet, your taste buds are probably going to change, right? They have to recalibrate. Your bowel habits are probably going to change. And you might even have some temporary detoxing symptoms, right, as the bad foods work their way out of your system. And there's going to be a time commitment to uh, learn a new way to shop and cook, right? That's going to take some time. But for anybody that views all of those things as negatives to be shunned are pain avoiders who unfortunately will never experience the long-term payoff. So remember this, anything of value has this rhythm, pain first, payoff later, or hassle and learning curve first, payoff later, right? Inconvenience may be first, but payoff later. Now, that's a quote from a book by Dr. Henry Cloud that I recommend. It's called uh, Never Go Back, 10 Things I'll Never Do Again. 
and he devotes an entire chapter to this topic of choosing short-term comfort over long-term benefit. And that's why I really liked that chapter from this book. Just was like, yeah, he talks about it like for those who are in business, for example, and they need to move to a bigger space, you know, just to grow. But they see all the hassles involved with that, you know, and so they never move. And so it applies to almost every area of life where we want something, but we're not willing to go through the, the hassle to get to that, uh, to achieve what we're you know, striving to do. So can you think of any other area of life where you have to face short-term trials to get to the good results? You know, I can think of many, like an exercise routine, if you're just starting that, right? That's going to be inconvenient maybe, and maybe be sore at first. Or if you're in a new relationship, that's going to take a learning curve. Or if you're learning to play the piano or the guitar, you're going to have to start off like a little baby, you know, taking lessons and Cooking without oil, how do you do that? You know, you have to figure that out. Those are all things where we have to go through that little short-term period of discomfort to get to the other side. What do you think, Amy? Have you seen that in your line of work as well, where people have to go through some short-term periods of adjustment? Oh, yeah. It, and it seems that we're we're so spoiled because there's so many things that all you need to do is click something or or do something, or ask something, and boom, your, your problem is solved. And we're just so used to, or even, you know, people, if they have a headache, they may, you know, take take some kind of acetaminophen or something. And they're just, we're so used to having a, a quick way to avoid pain or deal with pain. And sometimes, you, yeah, you do need to actually experience it. And, and people actually will say, if you have a mild headache, it's probably better just to lay down if you can in, in the dark and, and close your eyes. And that's the way of your body getting rid of toxins. And when you when you take a pain reliever like acetaminophen or, or Motrin, then you're ki killing off that, that uh, way that your body is going to be detoxifying that whatever is in there that it's trying to get rid of. But we're just so used to these things that we can just have access to. And I, and because of that, I think it's, it, it carries over into things like this where they, people are, they don't know how mm -hmm. to, uh, to, uh, you know, endure something for a, a little bit of time to get that long-term gain. Yeah. We sure do live in a society of instant gratification, right? Mm -hmm. We want things fast and we want it now and we want answers right away and, doesn't always happen. We want to see results right away. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that about the um, taking the acetaminophen. Um, Dr. Pam Popper just put out a little video with studies that show if you have a backache or some type of injury or, you know, or you're sore, it's best, like you said, to not try to take those drugs that mask the symptoms because now studies are showing that in the long term, you're going to be better off in the long term if you don't take those drugs that are masking the symptoms up front. It was really good information. Yeah, that is great information. I'm not surprised at that research. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, should we go on to the fifth barrier, which okay. is habits, right? I'm a big creature of habit. <laughs> I don't know if you are, but I certainly am. From my grocery store purchases to the recipes I picked, no, to my exercise and so on. And habits can be good, though. We're, we'll talk about that. But habits can become an issue when the dependency on unhealthy habits is going to prevent us from making changes. And I have seen that many times. When habits become too deeply ingrained, then it might be time to re-examine the importance that we're placing on those habits. Right? Now, like I said, habits in and of themselves can be good ones, there's nothing wrong with being a creature of habit if those habits are promoting good health. So we need to redirect our energy toward the positive habits and use them to replace the negative habits. So write down what your new habits will look like. For example, for breakfast now, you're going to have oatmeal and fruit instead of Pop-Tarts. You know, maybe you're mm -hmm. in the habit of having a Pop-Tart for breakfast. Okay, we got to scratch that and change it up. Or uh, you'll bring some healthy muffins in the car instead of stopping at the donut shop. You know, if you're in the habit of going to the donut shop every day, nope, you're going to 
pack some healthy muffins and bring those with you. Or for a sweet treat at night, maybe you're in the habit of having a nice cream bar, you know, or something, not a, a dairy-based treat. But from now on, you're going to have a homemade raspberry sorbet, you know, that's easy to make. And you can put that in the freezer and have a big bunch of it. So when we replace those habits with other habits, instead of trying to avoid the bad habit, you have to replace it with something healthy to make a good habit. And then when we perform the same actions day after day, habits develop and they become second nature. So there's what I meant to show you just as I was talking. <laughs> so habits can be good. We just have to redirect our energy toward the positive ones rather than the, neg the negative ones. So, yeah, I, I'm a creature of habit. Are you, Amy? I oh, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes to a fault, but to, or sometimes it's good thing, you know, like for, for me, because I'm a, I, I exercise and I'll exercise every day, even if whatever thing I'm following says, today is your day off. I'll do something anyway. I'll put on my workout clothes and I'll do something because I'm a creature of habit in a good way because I'll stick to it. But I'm a creature habit in a bad way that if I take a day off, it might turn into two or three. And then I've got a bad habit instead of a good habit. So, <laughs> <laughs> But you recognize that about yeah. yourself. So you yeah. take steps to do deal with it, which is the key. You're yeah. aware. All right. The next barrier is false perception. And this comes into play when people believe that that eating healthy is too hard or too expensive or too time consuming or whatever, or they believe that the foods are boring and tasteless, right? They don't think plant-based foods are going to be tasty, or they think that our foods lack nutrition. Those are all false perceptions, which can lead many people to believe, um, you know, that this isn't for them because again, they have false perceptions and they really, um, I mean, false perceptions can even be that they're eating healthier than they are. I've I've heard that a lot. Well, I'm re I'm eating pretty healthy, and then the more I talk to them, I realize they're not eating healthy at all. But they have a false perception that they are eating healthy just because they're not eating red meat. <laughs> they're still eating a bunch of you know bad foods, but in their mind they're eating healthy. So that's also a false perception. Sometimes our predispositions and assumptions play a big role in how we perceive reality, right? That's where false perception comes in, and it's really a common barrier. So some ways to overcome false perceptions would be to stay open-minded regarding independent research. Be willing to experiment with some new easy recipes, and then find a community of plant-based eaters, either locally or online, and hang out there to learn the successes that other people have. It's not going to be an overnight thing to overcome false perceptions because a lot of our are deeply ingrained, right? We truly believe that a healthy diet is going to be too hard. So we don't even give that diet a second thought because we've already decided that it's too hard or too expensive or I don't have time to do it. You know, there's excuses that are all based on false perception. So if you know someone who is in this boat, or maybe you are, maybe it's you, you know, you've created some limiting beliefs. We talked about limiting beliefs the last time I was on the show. And those also tie in with false perceptions. The key would be to, um, you've, you've got to break free of that by experimenting, be willing to step out of your comfort zone and experiment. Look at some research that says, no, it's not too expensive to eat this way. And here's here's an article on how why it's actually cheaper to eat this way than other ways. And is, is it too hard? Well, it's as hard as we're going to make it. So being sick is hard too. So choose your hard, right? You want to choose the hard of learning a new way to cook and shop? Or do you want to choose the hard of dealing with a chronic illness, you know, for the rest of your life, basically? Because chronic I love this. I, I got to talk to Dr. Hans Deal last week. Um, oh, he's delightful. And he's like, chronic means it never goes away, right? Chronic disease never goes away. It's chronic. And I had never thought of it that way. And I'm like, yeah. So that's hard too. Chronic disease is hard. But 
choose your heart if you're thinking this way of eating is too hard. But think about the cost of not eating this way. That's hard too. And then choose your hard. And please choose the hard that we're promoting here because once you're over the learning hump, it's no longer hard. It becomes second nature. Yeah. Yeah. E ES actually said eating really healthy is more challenging, but very doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this might be a good time for a true false. Okay. Here we go. To get ready, Dream Warriors. True or false? Refusing to acknowledge our food issues is a healthy coping mechanism we should consider. Hmm. Type in your answer. What do you think, Green Warriors? True or false? Okay, Sid. <laughs> that is false because that means you're in denial, right? If you're refusing to acknowledge that you have a food issue, that's <laughs> or when you're refusing to acknowledge that um, you have a food issue. How was the question? It was refusing to acknowledge our food issues is a healthy coping coping mis no refusing to acknowledge our problems is never a healthy coping mechanism for anything. <laughs> so just um ignoring or downplaying our problems just so we don't have to deal with them, that's never a good idea. E even though it might seem like the easiest thing to do, right? It's mm -hmm. the easiest thing to do, and it might offer a bit of temporary mental relief, but it's not gonna help you in the long term. So that's why we're talking about denial, which is the refusal to acknowledge that you have a food problem or how those foods are impacting your health. And again, it's pretending that a problem doesn't exist. And I'm not even sure how you'd recognize this as one of your barriers if you're truly in a state of denial, right? You wouldn't even recognize this <laughs> as an issue. Yeah, you deny that you had a, a denial problem. <laughs> <laughs> And if that sounds familiar, it you would not be alone because Gallup polls are now showing that Americans are less likely each year to see themselves as overweight mm -hmm. and they're less likely to even want to try to lose weight. So, you know, I think denial is a big part yeah. of that. I think you know? also a big part of it, Sid, is that the population itself is getting heavier and heavier and it's more normal to see people that are overweight. And so I think that we just compare ourselves to people around us and we feel that we're not, you know, we're not overweight because that's, I mean, even when I, if I go into a clothing store and I'll see a mannequin when I was younger, they didn't have mannequins that were overweight. They just had average sized mannequins, which were that represented the population at that time. Mm -hmm. And now the mannequins are now starting to represent the current population. So I think that that may be another reason why. Yeah. And you know what's sad? I was in a store the other day and they had a junior plus section, which I had never seen before. And I thought, you know, because even the younger folks now are putting on a lot of weight, you know, in their teenage years, which... Mm -hmm. What is 75% of our population is overweight, right? In well, it depends on who you ask. If really? you ask if you ask Dr. Furman, he'll get in the high 90s with that. Wow. Yeah, okay. because because he says that that what the recommended BMI is is really not acceptable as far as he's concerned. That the, mm -hmm. I mean, if you go into other countries, perhaps Asia, I mean, these things are not happening as often because those populations are getting exposed to our terrible food. But, you know, those people in general, if they're not eating that kind of food that we eat, they're very, you know, you, you can see their collarbones, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're slim. And so they, they would be below what, what a physician here might say is, a, is an acceptable BMI. And Dr. Furman says that, you know, he, he believes that the BMI should be lower than that. But that's that's a tough thing for a lot of people. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So he says it's up to 90 percent. Yeah. Our population. yeah. And, and he said and 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 some of those people that are not overweight are sickly. And, oh. and, and that's why they're not overweight. It's not because they're healthy. It's mm -hmm. because they're they have digestive problems or you know, things, oh. things along that line. Yeah. Wow. Well, the latest stat I saw that out of all of the obese or overweight people, like 42% are obese with a BMI over 30, but 
Yeah. I mean, that's going up and up too. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what he, yeah. So if Dr. Furman thinks the BMI should be lower, yeah. then that would even put more people into the obese category. Yeah. Probably. That's, that's, that's what his, he, he, that's what he says about it. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. I mean, Esselstyn has an interesting thing too. He thinks that we should kind of weigh what we weighed in high school. Mm, yeah. <laughs> As adults, and I'm thinking, I can't remember what I weighed in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, unfortunately, they won't be able to say that, you know, in years to come because, what, as what you were talking about in, in the kids' departments. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. I mean, if you weighed that much in high school, then that would have been, an, you know, an acceptable weight. And, and uh, yeah. That's very, very uh, thought provoking. Yeah, it is. All right. So back to denial, which is not a river in Egypt, or mm -hmm. it is, right? Mm -hmm. Denial is not a river. In Egypt. Not only a river in Egypt. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so if we do finally break out of denial and recognize that we have a problem with denial, then um, maybe this could be one of our things, would be not to use this as a coping mechanism, but if we are to evaluate why, you know, is dealing with the problem going to cause us anxiety or stress, or maybe it's just too difficult to admit aspects of our lives that we'd rather keep hidden. Like we, we'd rather keep that part of ourselves hidden, even from ourselves, you know, it's just embarrassing. Yeah. Or if you're stuck in denial though, you might even need to seek help, you know, professional help to acknowledge your problems and find out ways to face your problems rather than to deny them. Yeah. So it's kind of a biggie there, denial. Yeah, it is. There's always an underlying motive for it. Now, the eighth barrier is pride or rebellion or ego. So there's a difference between healthy pride and unhealthy pride, which is our ego. Unhealthy pride is when someone believes they're superior to others or they're, they're never going to get sick. You know, I've seen that in people. I like, I'm not going to get sick. And it's difficult for them to admit that they're making unhealthy food choices. And sometimes they feel like nobody's going to tell me what to eat, right? That's a prideful thing. Yeah. If you try to give them some constructive feedback, they, don't, they want to hear nothing about it. So any constructive uh, criticism about their food choices is either dismissed or it's viewed as a threat often. And they're typically resistant to new ideas or they often try to dominate the conversation or shut other people out. Um, I've even noticed that some folks with a prideful, rebellious attitude will try to sabotage the health efforts of even their own family members. Yeah. I've seen that happen. And pride is a very addictive pattern that can be difficult to overcome. So it's not the same as having a healthy pride in your accomplishments or, you know, things that are good. This is more of a, a rebellion type of thing. Now, the antidote for pride, <clears throat> and again, these are just little thimbleful sizes of advice. You know, if you recognize yourself in this, you'll have to take deeper steps, of course. But the antidote for pride is to set aside self-focus and develop a posture of humility. Because humility allows us to have an accurate opinion of ourselves, and it restrains us from becoming the center of our own worlds, right? It allows us to listen graciously to other people and be flexible in our own thought patterns. And again, these are tall orders, which are going to require some deep soul searching and determination and a sincere change of heart, which is not going to happen overnight, but it can happen. All right. Have you ever seen people try to sabotage their own family members, Amy? Oh, yes. Really? Oh, okay. yes. I have seen that. And it's, and, and sometimes like I'll hear, I'll, I'll, I'll hear people say that their spouse or, or, or whoever it is will say things like, you're not fun anymore, mm. you know, because, no. they, and I, I think that, you know, if you, if you have an addiction to something like food, you know, processed food. And, and you don't want to give that up. And then you see somebody else giving it up. You may decide that that's that if they give it up, then you may feel bad about yourself. Right. So it's kind of like that mirror. 
it almost seems that if that when somebody is on this has adopted this lifestyle, the people around them, it's almost like they're they're holding a mirror out to them. And there's and they're having to look at themselves and examine themselves. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is a, a fear of them, a fear of losing them. Like, oh, you know, if we're both overweight or obese and you get healthy and lose the weight, then maybe you'll leave me. Mm. You know, and I think yeah. that I, I don't know that I don't think that some of the people who are sabotaging realize that that could be a reason why they're doing it. But also, you know, the pride. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very sad because oftentimes I feel that the people that, that are trying to adopt this lifestyle are people pleasers, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And so this, this sabotaging just feeds right into it, you know, where they're yeah. trying to make that person please that person instead of doing what's good for themselves. Yeah. And what you just described about someone who doesn't want the other person to change, that person is very self-focused, right? And that's the heart of pride when we're thinking about, oh, how is this going to affect me? Rather than, mm-hmm. oh, my spouse or my partner wants to get healthy, I should support that. But instead, they're self-focused about how it's going to affect them, it, you know, and that's going to cause them maybe to try to sabotage the other or make comments like you're not fun anymore. That's very hurtful. Yeah. 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 But it could be fear based too. Like you were saying, they're afraid the other person's going to get healthy and then leave <laughs> because mm-hmm. they don't want to stay in that relationship. Lots of things to think about, isn't there? Yes, there is. I, ho- I, I know this is very thought provoking for all the people that are watching and listening. And, and I think that they're going to see some of these things either in themselves or the people that they're, that they're with that are along the ride with them. Yeah. Yeah. Was it last time I was on, we talked about family pressure, like tips to survive family pressure. It's not easy, but it can be done. Yeah. 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 And well, I'll put a link to that because that's, that, that's a good one also, because there are, there, I think that that's a lot, a lot of what, what people are going through family pressure or just the pressure in general from, from friends, you know, and socializing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? I think we might even going to be talking about it on a slide or two. Okay. As we go forward. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So let me get back to the next barrier. Here it is. Oh my gosh. All right. So this one is family and social pressure. I knew I heard it somewhere. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And this is something that I see a lot. And I'm sure you too, you do too, Amy. It can have a major influence on our food choices. And many people tell me that the reason a healthy diet won't work in their house is because the others would never go for it, right? So when family members or friends are indulging in all these unhealthy foods, sometimes it can just seem easier to join in and eat that bucket of chicken rather than stick to your healthy diet. Yeah. Or maybe you just want to avoid the scrutiny, especially if they're making fun of you or making you feel guilty in some way. And I've seen that too, you know, where they chastise the people that are trying to eat healthy. That might be that pride thing we were just talking about. That's what that was coming to mind. Yeah. So the first line of defense here would be to have a frank discussion with your family members and assure them that they're not under attack and they won't be forced to eat as you we do oh. rather than you to want to eat better and then ask for their support. Just ask them right out how important this is to you. Ask for their support and then share exactly how they can help you. Like who's going to do the shopping and cooking. You're going to have to negotiate some things. Are they willing to store their junk food out of sight, like in a different cabinet or are they willing to join you once in a while? If you make, you know, a, a really good dinner, would they be willing to join with that? Um, There's just a lot of things. I've seen couples work this out when one goes plant-based and one does not. And it can be sticky at the start, but there are ways to work it out. You know, one couple, he does his thing, she does hers. You know, they just keep it totally separate. Other couples will be, they make a common base like spaghetti and then they each do their own toppings or they make rice and a stir fry and then one adds the meat at the top. So they, you know, they can 
have a common base of a meal and then they each do their own thing with that. Other times the wife cooks two meals. You know, I've seen that happen too, where she'll, or one spouse, maybe it's not the wife, it could be, you never know. Or if they're, especially if there's kids in the house too, and they want something different. And so remember that you do not need your family support to change your diet. I mean, would it be easier? Heck yeah, it would be so much easier if you had their support, but you can succeed on your own. Because again, I've seen a lot of people figure out how to make it work and I know it can be done. So if you're interested, I do have a short presentation about this on my YouTube channel. You know, it's called Surviving Family and Peer Pressure. Because sometimes wow. your friends can be a, a barrier too, right? If you're used to going out and partying with your friends, and you're not eating the way they do anymore, that can sure be a barrier to you sticking with your diet. You know, there's things to think about there. Agree on a restaurant. You know, you call ahead and find out what restaurant can make food according to your compliant way and see if they'll join you there. Or That's a whole nother topic of restaurant foods. I mean, probably anywhere you go, you could find something to eat, even if they have a potato yeah. salsa on top, you know, something. <laughs> yeah, I actually recently went out with uh, two couples and they, they're not plant-based or anything. And so I, and I, and I said, whatever restaurant you want to go to, you know, just tell me ahead of time so I can look it up online. So I don't have to spend so much time going through the whole menu. So I'll know what to, to get. And this place, it was basically like had a lot of bar food, you know, fried foods and things like that, but they did have salads. And so I just told them to bring me a salad without any of the things that I didn't want on it that would, would not be on my plan. And I had a, a small bag with me with a little cooler pack. And uh, my husband, Rick, had made sushi. So, of course, that didn't have any fish in there or anything. But and so then what we did and we brought a little dressing that we liked and we just put the sushi on top of our salad. And then we had a little bottle of dressing and, and put it on there and it was delicious. And then people wanted to, us to pass around our dressing because they <laughs> wanted to taste it and they all loved the dressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's ways around it. Absolutely. I love that idea. Yeah. Bring your own dressing and even your own food. Sometimes too, I say it's STEM, S-T-E-M, scan the entire menu. This may not have worked at the restaurant you were at, but if you look at the side dishes on a menu, yeah. like they'll have chicken with fingerling potatoes. Okay. Wow. Could they give you the fingerling potatoes and the asparagus that's over here with the fish? So sometimes you can build a plate just on those side dishes. Yeah, you have to think of the menu as a list of the things that are in the refrigerator and pantry in the kitchen, and right? And you're just looking at their, their list of ingredients that they have. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are ways. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes. The next barrier, and this is a huge one, is emotional eating, mm -hmm. which happens when we deal with the stressors of life. By turning to food, and as an emotional eater, I can totally relate to this. <laughs> we use food to soothe our anxiety or stress, sadness or anger or boredom, or to delay doing uh, dealing with things or problems. And I can certainly attest to that one because when I'm faced with something I don't want to do, even if it's like I, I need to create a webinar, you know, or something, and I, I it's, I'm drawing a blank. Well, my head's in the refrigerator. <laughs> At that point, so I am. A, when I'm bored, you know, I I know my triggers. If I'm bored, if I'm upset, or if I don't want to do something that I have to do, then I I I could turn to eating if I'm not comfortable. If I'm not careful, I can yeah. do that. Well, so. I mean, it's a, it's a habit that that a lot of people have developed over a lifetime. You know, I always think it's it's amusing when. People will go to the refrigerator, open it up, look in, inside, and they don't find anything that they want. And then an hour later, they'll go back to the refrigerator and open it up again as if, <laughs> as if there's something new in there, you know, and, and just keep going back to it. So I think that we've we just rehearsed this over many, many years. And then, <laughs> yeah, so you really do have to develop other, other uh, strategies. Yeah. And if it's emotional eating, we're not looking for broccoli and rice, right? We're looking for uh, <laughs> something either really sweet or salty or what, you know, whatever yeah. that comfort 
thing is right. <laughs> right. And you can rationalize in your head. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling right or, and I deserve this. There's, oh, there's so many things that can go through someone's head when they're trying to, 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 to battle this. Right. And even happy emotions can turn, you know, make us turn to food. Like we're going to reward ourselves because we did something good. You know, we reached a goal. I'm going to reward myself with some off the wall treat. I'm like, why do we do that? I noticed that on holidays, sometimes we'll say, what's the holiday? I'm going to eat this or that. Why, why would you sabotage your health just because it's a holiday? <laughs> yeah, I'm I telling know. you, I had a relative that used to say, I'll walk it off. And back then I didn't realize that it takes much more than a walk to burn through <laughs> that. And you could do a high, high intensity exercise for 45 minutes and be dripping with sweat and you still didn't burn it off. <laughs> so that walk wasn't, wasn't going to do it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So if you're an emotional eater, you have to develop a plan of attack by knowing your weak spots know what emotions are going to send you to the kitchen or the drive up window. And you have to develop alternative coping methods that uh, don't involve food, right? So if you're bored, devise a plan of action where you're going to stay out of the kitchen. You're going to organize a closet or a shelf. You're going to do take up a hobby or go for a walk or have a cup of tea or read a book. You know, you've got to figure out an alternative strategy. Sometimes just sitting down for five minutes will be all it takes to break that that knee jerk emotional response for me, just five minutes will do it. If you uh, eat whenever you're lonely, then arrange to visit friends or, you know, call somebody. If you eat when you're anxious and here's what works for me, just give yourself permission to stop and sit down for a few minutes, take deep breaths and refocus and recognize what's happening, right? Press pause, take a time out, and just face that emotion right then instead of trying to suppress it with food. Just allow that emotion to be front and center and just think about it. And remember that this is going to pass. You know, I know right now I'm really upset. This is going to pass, though. And I'm not just going to go stuff myself with food because that's not going to help the situation. <laughs> so remind yourself that emotional cravings cannot be filled with food and are most likely only going to make you feel worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And even if, it, if you might feel, think that you feel better, it's just a temporary feeling. It's not going to change what, what happened. It's, right. And it didn't solve the issue, it right? Didn't. It just delayed it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this might be a good time for a true and false. Okay. True or false. Here we go. So true or false, Green Warriors. Food addictions can result from continually eating foods that release dopamine in the brain's pleasure center. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Type in your answers, Green Warriors. Okay, Sid, tell us what it is, what your answer is. The answer is definitely true because food addiction is the next big barrier we'll talk about. And it's a huge one that results when we've lost control over the ability to stop eating certain foods, especially the highly palatable ones, palatable ones, which trigger that release of dopamine in the brain's pleasure center, like sugar, chocolate, cheese, meats, salts, and fats all fall into this category, right? So if you're obsessing about certain foods or craving them to the point where you'll go way out of your way to get them, or if you experience withdrawal or negative emotions when you go without certain foods, then you might have a food addiction, right? I know I shared my mocha latte addiction story with you last time I was here. I had allowed myself to get addicted to mocha lattes at one point years ago. So, yeah, and even dried dried foods, you know, food like like French fries and things like that, where the moisture is taken out of them. They're, they're calorically dense and or, you know, even things that, that may be, think that we might think that are healthy, like dates, you know, they're, they're calor calorically dense. And if you eat too many of those, that could be, that even a healthy food could, could contribute to weight gain and, and uh, food addiction. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Know your triggers. Like sugar is a, like a major one that I see. Sugar is in everything, barbecue mm. sauce. I mean, everything is filled with sugar. 
And that's a tough one to break. What What is it the studies show that mice will actually burn their feet to get to sugar where yeah. they won't try to get the cocaine? They'll, you know, studies show that if they get these mice addicted to different substances, that sugar yeah. is more powerful than cocaine. In yes, the- it is. And they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll electrocute themselves or burn themselves absolutely to get to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And cheese is a big one because it contains casomorphins, right? Casomorphin, think morphine. Like it's, uh, it keeps the baby cow close to the mother when it's weaning. You know, it's got that addictive property. Yeah, and that's just the milk. It's not the highly concentrated form of the milk, which is the cheese. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there gets a lot of things working against us <laughs> when yeah. it comes to food addiction. So once we have developed a food addiction, though, and I love there's so many um, people out there that have overcome this. Chuck Carroll, his story is amazing from PCRM. Yeah. If you've I ever heard him on the show, absolutely. Oh my gosh, he's yeah. addicted to Taco Bell, and big time, big man. Time. What he was eating was unreal, and mm-hmm. when he was in with Darley, actually punched a hole through the wall. I mean, it was you know, did you hear that story? It's like wow. But he, look at him today; he oh, he yeah. overcame it. He did. So the best way to deal with food addictions is to sanitize your environment. Again, these are tips that you'll have to see if you fit into this and take further action. Sanitize your environment by removing the addictive foods, right? Total abstinence is important because if you're just going to try to eat one Oreo a day or one piece of string cheese a day or one spoon of ice cream, you're just going to continue drip feeding that addiction until it rears its ugly head again and just takes total control over you again. And abstinence seems to be the best way. Would you agree with that, Amy? You just oh, it's hard to wean off of addictive foods. It's hard to wean off. Oh yeah, you, and and you're you're. Uh, I think Dr. Goldhammer says if 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 you could have modified, you it would have worked, but it it didn't work, so it's not going to work. And right. just, you know, because I think people have been kidding themselves for long periods of time that if they just had a thimble size serving of this, that it would be okay and that they would be able to control it. And, you know, over the years, I think a lot of people have, have tried to, to fool themselves into thinking that that was a good strategy and it didn't prove to be. So it wouldn't be for me. No, me neither. If it's in the house, it's in your mouth, right? That's yes. the thing. Oh, Yeah. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. So know your trigger points too is another tip here and plan ahead. Like if you're going to the family gathering, bring a healthy casserole or a crock pot of soup and a plant-based dessert, right? Bring your own food. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the office brings in glazed donuts every Wednesday morning for the meeting, then you bring a healthy pumpkin muffin or some alternative and a- avoid that break room altogether. So you've got to go on a plan of offense here, right? Or defense. You've got to be thinking about these things. And then set a deadline by which all of the junk foods will be out of the house, right? If if you are going to try to wean off, I mean, I, we don't recommend that. But if there's, you know, if there's something you don't want to throw away because of the money factor, you know, a lot of people say, well, I paid a lot of money for that. I'm not just going to throw it out, you know. All this sugar Sounds like stuff. your, den- your denial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it was poison, which it is, yeah. you wouldn't be saying, well, I need to finish all this poison first because <laughs> yeah. I spent money on it. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> but if the, if you are a person that is going to have to set a deadline, like a week from now, all junk foods are going to be out of this house. Don't make it like a month from now. Make it like in, you know, a couple days. And then you're going to have healthy alternatives in place of that. So again, we're not just removing something, we're replacing it with a better option. And this is where the planning pays off. So we can crowd out those addictive foods with healthy options. And if you live with people who are still going to have junk food in the house, then you need to go back to that barrier on family pressure and find ways to negotiate those issues. Like, you know, will they store that in their room or something? All right. The last barrier is a spiritual attack barrier, and this won't be of interest to everyone, but um, it's laid out in my book for anybody that has an interest in that. Or you can email me and I will send you this chapter on that topic. 
Okay, so now that we have covered some of the biggest barriers, I'm going to tell you about the barrier combo pack. Because <laughs> many barriers overlap. And here's, here's an example. So say you're looking for comfort food. That can result from emotional eating, food addiction, or habit. All three of those result in seeking comfort foods, right? If you have a negative view of healthy foods, that could stem from false perception or from um, avoidance of pain or from fear of change. You know, and wait a second, I, I got mixed up there. Hang on one second. So if you have a negative view of healthy foods, that could be false perception or denial or pride. We talked about being in denial, right? Yeah. Or pride if you've got a negative view. And then this one, complacency about food, about making healthy changes, that could result from fear of change or the avoidance of pain or willful ignorance, which is apathy. So a lot of these tips can overlap so that's why reading through all the helpful tips can be useful to more than one barrier. Because as I mentioned at the start, this presentation just scratches the surface and we're only looking at small tidbits of advice. But if you're struggling with one or more barrier here, then diving deeper or seeking help might even be in order. So one of the key things that all of these barriers, and when I wrote about this chapter in my book, I noticed the number of key words in all of the proposed solutions that reflect the need for thought and awareness. Words like learn, determine, examine, recognize, know, choose, decide. Mm. All of those words indicate that our minds have to be fully engaged if we intend to overcome these roadblocks and these barriers that keep us stuck. So mindfulness is the key, as it is with most things, and the battle is often right between our ears. Yeah. So remember that everything you need to succeed with a healthy diet is already inside you. We just have to develop the game plan and then kick those barriers to the curb, you know, because it can be done. I've seen it done time and time again with people that I never thought would be where they are today. They've been able to do it. So I know that everybody has it within themselves to do this, but it's going to take work and our minds have to be engaged. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that the people that are tuning in and listening or watching, I think they're ready. Yeah. Yeah, I think they okay. are. And I think this, this is definitely going to help them. Well, good. I'm going to stop sharing now. I'll just put my website there. SidNotter.com is my website. If you want to go there, I have some freebies. Oops, oh, today. great. <laughs> yeah, well, we're We'll put that up again later if you want to, or, or I'll put it up later so that okay. we can remind people about that. Okay. Well, we did have some questions that came through. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It, 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 there are a lot of things that, that, that I talk about with people, but you just kind of put it all, all together in a very, very good way of uh, point, pointing out the very specific things that, it, although you said it was just a quick blip and you could dive deeper, but very doable things and very uh, great pearls. So Steve, hi, Steve. He wanted to know, how do I kick diet pepper for good? <laughs> it's the sugar. Is it sugar, diet pepper, I would imagine? Like what's, what is attracting him to the diet pepper? Is it the sweetness or the fizziness or what? Um... Yeah. I mean, there's things inside of these sodas that we aren't really, if you turn around and look at those ingredients, you, you're you going to see the sugar and you're going to see salt. <gasps> they put salt in soda? Oh, yeah, mm. they do. Because it makes you want to drink more because it makes you thirsty. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And, and then, I, yeah. What? Many sodas have phosphoric acid too. So I'm not sure if Dr. Pepper does, but read the label. If it has phosphoric acid, your body's going to leach calcium to try to buffer that acid. So mm. it's bad for your bones, yeah. any pop that has, you know, acids. So it's a sugar. It sounds like it might be a sugar thing there. And just as we were talking about, you have to find something to replace it and just get rid of it. Don't try to drink a sip a day, you know, the best thing to do to do if you can is to 
find something sweet to replace it. It might be a, a sweetened tea or something. If you want fizziness, maybe get a seltzer water and add a little juice to it, like cranberry juice or, you know, if it's the fizziness that you're missing. But yeah, there's no easy way. You're just going to have to stop drinking it and replace it with something. Yeah. Or it could even be the caffeine in there too. Oh. And, and I think just... For some people, they have this this brand loyalty to things that maybe they've been, it sounds like Steve's been drinking this for a while. And it could even be that he started when he was younger. And and it, so it has a lot of good memories attached to it, maybe. Mm -hmm. but, but also, I think that people are, if they're, if they're tired, right, mm -hmm. they, they're looking for an energy boost. And sometimes it's just that, you you know, you're not getting enough sleep. And, but it, but it could be, I think that it could be definitely very addictive. And, and if it, if, if, depending on how much he's having it, he might be getting a lot of caffeine and he might get a headache if he stopped or, That's you know, cool. or not, or not feel very well. I, I remember a while ago, my, my uh, in-laws came to town and my mother-in-law loved to drink coffee and I had a coffee maker. I wasn't plant-based at the time and I had a coffee maker. But at that time, I was drinking decaf coffee because I thought that it was better for you. And I didn't even think about, you know, whether it was decaf or not. And I just had that pot of coffee and she she was drinking the whole pot. And then I was making more because she loved coffee. And she got this uh, perspiration on the top of her lip. And, she, and I said, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm not. I'm not okay. I don't feel well at all. You know, she said, but I'm, I don't, I'm not sick. I just don't feel right. And uh, then we went out someplace and she um, ordered a cup of coffee. And then she said, I feel so much better now. Right. Mm -hmm. so, and she said, was that decaf? And I said, yeah, you know, because to me, it, it didn't make a difference, you know, if it was caffeine or not. I just, you know, drank it because I could put cream and sugar in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah so i think that if you did kick dr pepper it may i don't know you might get you might get a really bad headache if you quit all at once but you know in that case that's true yeah might, so it, yeah. it could be physical food addiction for steve it might just be habit so that's another thing is it just a habit or is it something yeah. that you're physically craving that would be a question yeah so if you could at least you know say to yourself that you're only going to have a certain amount throughout the day. And then uh, if, if, if you drink a lot, because then you might get a really bad headache. But I wonder yeah. if they have shorty cans, you know, if he's drinking a can and then they have the shorty cans mm, that you can buy. That would Years be ago, nice. that's how my yeah. husband weaned off of Pepsi. That's it's smart. Me. Yeah. Buy the shorty cans and have one a day until you're over mm. it. And I think, I think it's a lot of ritual involved too. I find that that's people who smoke cigarettes have that, it's this ritual of, 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 you know, opening, opening it up and hearing that, that noise that it makes mm. when it releases the, and, and then, you know, either drinking it out of the can or, or whatever it is, it sounds like there's a ritual to it too. I think you can do this, Steve, you know? Yeah. Let's see. What would be some good replacements though? What would be, mm. um. Let's think about that, like a sweetened, healthy yeah. drink with um, date syrup or do you have any recommendations yeah. there? I actually had um, from uh, California Balsamics and he did a demonstration of mocktails mm. and where he takes his sweet flavored balsamic vinegars and puts them in some kind of a club soda or, or, or some kind of fizzy, fizzy water and makes these mocktails out of them and they taste so good. Mm. So that's, that's something else that you might be able to do. And it might, you know, make, make it a special ritual where you maybe put a sliced piece of fruit in there or a frozen piece of fruit in there, you know, and, and make it so that you're really treating yourself. That sounds great. Another thing I like to do is make date paste and put it in a hot cup of tea and then let it cool and then ice it. So you've got a sweet drink still, but it's mm. sweetened with dates. Strawberry lemonade is another one with date paste. So there are ways to get a sweeter drink using just date paste. But yeah. like Amy said earlier, we don't want to get addicted to date paste either. So yeah. we want to just, <laughs> you know, but as a transition. Yeah, as a transition. Be, you know, it, yeah. Sounds, it sounds very good. 
Very, very good. So ES said, I'm SOS free. A barrier I face is it's really challenging to find food. You mean out to eat like at restaurants? Yeah, or? I'm not sure. Yeah, if he's oh. still on, maybe he can clarify. I'm not really sure. I mean, I know that when I first adopted this lifestyle, I was SOS free, no sugar, oil, or salt. And it wasn't, the, the food didn't taste very good when I, when we first made it. So, you know, just trying to find recipes that, that were tasty was difficult, but yeah, mm. I don't know if he means going out or, or, or just finding recipes to make food at home. But if you're still there, yes, if you want to type in and clarify, we can do that. Yeah. On my YouTube channel, I have a whole video on how to eat out. So maybe that would be a helpful what to order at a Mexican restaurant or an Italian restaurant or things like that. Maybe that would be of help. Yeah. And I have a, a five free recipes that I offer. So if anybody wanted to get recipes that are SOS free, they could go to my website, thegreenwithamy.com and then do slash join. And then I'll send you five free recipes and they're all SOS free and really tasty. So that, that's another uh, solution if you were looking for, for solutions like that. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to get around it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to look and see what else we have. Oh, here's one. So Linda said, I have trouble when my mom visits. She buys food for me that are off plan and I just can't say no. What do I, why do I do this and what can I do? Wow. Hmm. I guess why is mom doing that if she knows, you know, that's not your eating plan, but maybe she sees it as love, you know, or you never know. But anyway, she's, the mom is bringing food home that's not on her plan. Well, my mental trip trick is I don't eat that anymore. So that helps me say no to that food. I don't eat that anymore, mom. I'm so sorry. I don't eat that anymore. You know, I would try to make it a loving thing. But you can have it. Why don't you, you why don't you enjoy that? You know, I'm on a different plan right now and I'm going to stick to it because I really want to get healthy. It's just going to take conversation with her to not bring that food in. And when she sees that maybe you're not going to give into it and have it, maybe that will help change her, you know, her, her thought that you, I know when I first went plant-based, my relatives thought, oh, here, eat this. Like they were sneaking me food. Like they <laughs> I really help wanted you. to eat that and <laughs> depriving myself. I'm like, no, I really don't want to eat that. You know, they, they didn't get it. Maybe that's what she's doing. And I'm hard to say without knowing the whole situation. Yeah. And sometimes I think that some people are testing us too and and think and and trying to prove to themselves maybe that that this is not an easy thing to do. And I'm going to prove it. And not not in a, not always in a in a in a mean way, but in their mind, they're thinking, they may not be aware that they're thinking this. And they're saying, if I can just show that this person can go off plan, then I can prove that this is not a doable thing. Mm -hmm. And, 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 th and therefore I'm going to prove to myself that I can't do it because that person can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think a good way to flex your muscles is to say, I, I'm not just doing this for me, but I'm doing this as being an example for the people I love. And to show them that I can do without this food and, and show them how I, how I make the, you know, make substitutions or whatever it is, and then show them that, yes, you can, you can live like this and mm -hmm. it is doable. So, yeah. And to say, mom, I know you mean the best and you love me, but could you support me in this? Cause I really, you know, ask for her support rather than it's yeah. all in the attitude, right? It's yeah. all in the attitude of how it's presented. Absolutely. Oh, ES is still there. And ES said at restaurants. That's mm -hmm. what I yeah. was. That was your yeah. guess. Look me up on YouTube, Sid Notter. There's a whole thing on how to eat out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's there's actually a lot of apps too. And, and one of them is uh, Happy Cow, but not always SOS free there. And, but there is, there are a couple of uh, oil free uh, resources too. So we, we can help you out there. Thanks for clarifying that, 
but uh, definitely, you know, for example, I, I don't know if you were around the podcast when I was talking about how I bring some food with me to restaurants that it's compliant for me and I'll bring dressing and then I'll add it to something that I already order. And then Sid had talked about ordering different items off the menu that could possibly be there. So if you didn't get to see that part, you can catch it on the replay. Yeah. Oh, wow. We have so many more questions, but we want to <laughs> also give you a, a chance to, to uh, talk about what you do and how people can get in touch with you. Yeah. Well, my website is sidnotter.com. Just my name right is right there. C-Y-D-N-O-T-T-E-R. I'm also going to be doing a live cooking class on May 20th with two other chefs. We're doing a plant-based burger, scrumptious plant-based burgers and more cooking class. And I think Amy has the link there in the chat box for yeah, more information about that. that. So that people can uh, go to that and, and check it out. And I'll also be putting it in the, uh, in the comments below also in the show notes so that people mm -hmm. can I've see that. Some, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Amy. Go ahead. Oh, I've got some courses too on my tab, Inflammation and Your Diet, which is a course I taught at our local college for many years. If you've got some inflammatory issue, that might be a course you'd be interested in taking. So just go to sidnotter.com and there's a courses tab there and also a transition program as well. So for people that want to transition to healthy eating, but don't know where to start. <laughs> and that's who you help too, Amy, I'm sure, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. I just wanted to put this up on the uh, on your on the screen here to show your uh, your website, sidnotter.com. And we are going to be doing a book giveaway. And it's not it's not today because it's launching today. And so this is again, I told you about this in the beginning of our, our show. Sid has this wonderful book called The Plan A Diet, and I'm going to be putting in the show notes and in the comments how you can try to win this. If you don't win it, I still suggest you go get it because it's a wonderful <laughs> book. And and it's it, it gives so many different resources. And Sid had touched upon this um, a little bit because she, um, and you can get more information, but she also has a lot of scriptures in here too because one of the, the, the reasons that people may uh, give you to not adopt this lifestyle or in your mind is because of things that you may see in the Bible and scriptures. And boy, you, you back up a lot, back it up a lot with scriptures and it's dispersed throughout the, the book, but it's, it's also a lot of practical knowledge for, for taking on this lifestyle. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to actually, uh, Talk talk about that pretty soon. Oh, and Angela Biscetti said, spectacular presentation as always by Sid Nodder of the Plan A Diet on the always wonderful Be Green with Amy. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, she's so sweet. She really is. I really she want is. to thank you, isn't she? Yeah. And she's going to be on the show again. She's been on several times and she'll be coming back on. She always has some wonderful um, exercise classes that she shares with us. So I, I wanted to thank you so much, Sid, for your pearls of wisdom about adopting a plant-based lifestyle and how to overcome these barriers that we talk about. And I, I want everybody, you know, instead of applauding, we can't applaud, she wouldn't hear it. So just click like or give a heart or something or put something in the comments to tell Sid how much you appreciated this presentation because I surely did. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. I love being on your show. It's just oh, so fun. I, I love having you. And I also wanted to um, encourage everybody to talk about what was your takeaway from today. So type in the comments, what was your takeaway? Like one of my takeaways is pain first, pay off later. I like that. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> and um, I also wanted to thank Just Task Voice because she did the promos and she did the voiceovers. And Just Task Voice, tell us who's coming up next. Susie Ann Liebarger lost 68 pounds and healed her ulcerative colitis when she chose a whole food plant-based lifestyle. Join us on Wednesday, May 10th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific on Be Green with Amy Live. Oh, 
that's going to be exciting too. So I posted the, the link to where you can go for this book giveaway, and that's going to be very exciting. And we'll be announcing it on one of my next live shows. We'll have a spinning wheel, and it'll randomly pick a name. So that's going to be a wonderful, fun thing. And again, I want to thank all of you Green Warriors for watching and listening. And as a special offer to you, I wanted to tell you, I told you a little bit about this earlier too, that I do have uh, five free recipes that I wanted to give to you. And all you have to do is to go to my website, which is begreenwithamy.com. And then you just type in slash join. And then from there, you will get the five free recipes. It'll tell you how to go ahead and do that. So I'm so happy that you guys joined us today. I'm so happy to see you again, Sid. And everybody, why don't you go ahead and take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and take your left hand and grab your right shoulder. Now squeeze, because that's a hug from me to you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to join me and Sid, saying my tagline go ahead and type it in the comments below are you ready sid yep okay well until i see you again remember be strong be well and be green, green. <laughs> <laughs> thanks sid bye everybody <laughs> oh i didn't did I, I wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> I made sure I had everything. Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green.